is Dr. Philip Chu. He's the branch of the Integrated Phys Physical and Ecological Modeling and Forecasting at the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration for the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab in Ann Arbor. He graduated with a PhD in atmospheric sciences right here at The Ohio State University. His research includes hydrodynamic modeling and coastal forecasting. Please welcome Dr. Chu. Good afternoon. It's, it's good to, to be back. Uh, I don't know if you could imagine a bug guy uh, living in Ann Arbor for, <laughs> for living, okay, and, and get a job. Uh, it's just great to be back. And, uh, because I'm so happy I'm actually going to share two things with you instead of one. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the uh, latex snow, but it's more on the forecasting, modeling, and research part of it. Think about it as a transition to the next generation accurate weather forecasting system that could accurately predict the late effects snow. The next one, uh, late effects snow, everybody knows the danger, the impact uh, and in the Great Lakes region. The second part of my talk is going to be on medial tsunami. That's an overlooked hazard in the Great Lakes for a long, long time but recently get a lot of attention from the public and also uh, from National Weather Service. So I'm going to introduce some of the media tsunami science research detection forecasting thing uh, NOAA is working on right now. So uh, we have a clicker here. Okay. This one? are my collaborators. Uh, basically, we are the hydrodynamic modeler doing for the Great Lake forecasting system. Uh, collaborator including Stan Benjamin and Curtis Alexander in Boulder, Colorado, Israel Lab. It's a big team there. It's probably 15 scientists over in that group. Also, um, Ayumi Manome and Lindsay Fitzpatrick from the Corporate Institute of Great Lakes Research at the University of Michigan. Um, Weather Forecast Office, Greg Mann in the uh, Detroit office, and also Jim Nelson at the Weather Prediction Center in College Park. <clears throat> All right, so, so the overall goal is basically to fill, achieve NOAA, particularly uh, Weather Service mission by building a weather-ready nation. And one of those requirements is to save life and properties by developing an accurate forecasting, weather forecasting system could uh, detect and provide warning for hazardous events, of course, including the late effect snow. Um, and the way we try to do it is using several different operational weather forecasting models, try to combine and look at all the variables that might impact the accuracy of late effects snow and see if we could improve that, particularly in the improving the timing, the amount, location, and bending of the late effects snow event. I don't know how many were, of you were here uh, 20 years ago when Tom Mizio, the Buffalo office uh, scientist, gave a talk on late effects snow. How many? Raise the hand. Few. I was in the audience as a graduate student and working on surface heat flux and the lake surface temperature. And then I was thinking, this is fascinating stuff. I wonder, you know, uh, would it be fun to sort of incorporate the heat flux and the surface temperature and combine with it to improve the lake effect snow? So little did I know, it only take 20 years. And right now, I'm working on exactly the same thing. <coughs> so, I want to thank Zach in the Cleveland office uh, early this morning to give the great overview of the Christmas snow event in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania last year. So I could skip probably half of my slides and just give you a quick overview on why it happened, how it happened, how to predict, detect that, and how we plan to improve that. So in a one sentence to summarize, late effect snow or late effect basically is cold air pass the warm lake 
and get all the moisture out and then dump the lot of preserved snow in the downwind side of the uh, lake. So that's why Rochester, uh, Cleveland, Erie, um, Syracuse got so much snow instead of you know, the one upper lake, Toronto, much nicer, right? So that's why. And those, I, I want to show you, you know, we cannot blame weather service for not predicting um, that, that particular event because it's really a challenging and difficult task to get everything right. And I could show you why it, it's, it's so difficult. Now, you, you already said this, just look at the lake impact, you know, create a cloud, create all the moisture, and then bring it to the downwind part of the, the land. That, oh, that doesn't look good. All right, I'll pass that. <laughs> so, you know, to able to predict the lake effects, no. What are the basic requirements? This is a very simple. Those basically four or five necessary requirements in order to build a reliable forecasting system or warning system. It's not, not limited to the lake effects, no. It's, you know, tornado, meteor tsunami, no. It's all the same framework. What do you need? It's when I look at it, you start with the science. You got to understand the process, you know, how that works. And then try to identify the cause, the process, and impact. Then you collect as much data as you have and try to verify your theory or hypothesis and then building the network in able to initialize your model, provide detection, and try to you know, help the model do the validation. Then you need to have a model. And you, not only do you need a weather forecast model, but you also need a lake circulation model. You also need to have a three-dimensional ice model. Then plus, how about wave? You might need a wave model as well. And the thing is, you need to combine them all together in an integrated fashion. So all the physical process, all the variable exchange, do it correctly. Then you could predict the correct surface heat flux, surface temperature, wind field. And then you could predict the band, the amount of the snow or you know, the timing of that event. So it is really hard, and then you need to have the infrastructure, you know, coordinate all the agencies, and then finally, not the plus, the, the better word should be communication. A lot of the thing is the education, the outreach to the public, and then how do you communicate those warnings, you know, whether it's an improbable probability, probabilistic or ensemble means, and then how you deliver those messages is also important. So, I want to emphasize, doesn't matter what system or what hazard you are working on, to have a good system, you pretty much need to have all five of those uh, set up correctly. All right, so for this particular project, what we are looking for, uh, because usually <coughs> our general impression is, you know, the timing wasn't right, the bending wasn't right, uh, the amount of the snow required some adjustment. So we look, we look into all this, you know, there's so many different variables and factors. Each one has its own initial errors and uncertainty. You probably heard this, all models are wrong, but some are just work better than the others. So the best way to do is to compare directly with the direct measurement and you validate those variables one by one. So <clears throat> what we are trying to look at, try to look you know, both the high resolution rapid refresh model, the operational three kilometer continental US uh, weather forecast model, or some of the wolf output, then we'll look at the most important one, the variable, heat flux combination, especially the latent heat and the sensible heat. So when you think about everything, the, the late impact is the correct lake surface temperature and the air temperature that drive to derive the formulation for sensible and latent heat flux. If that value is off, then your temperature is off. If your temperature off, then your weather forecast, circulation, wind field, everything is off. Then you probably won't get the time right, you won't get the snow band right, and you won't get the amount right. So our hypothesis is looking for all those model output right now and see where the largest <coughs> error our suspect is the latent and sensible heat flux. So how do we fix that? <coughs> <coughs>
direct measurement. For a modeler, you could never have enough direct measurement, especially on critical variables. So those six lighthouses in the Great Lakes, in addition to all the meteorological <coughs> network that we collect the real-time wind data, air temperature, humidity, all the meteorological information, coastal network, all the water temperature, but we still don't know the exact <coughs> evaporation rate or the sensible and heat, latent heat flux. So we put eddy coherence tower on six lighthouses doing direct measurement, and then we measure those light, uh, lighthouse direct measurement compared with the model. We compare with three different surface heat flux diagram plus three different models, and you could see, you know, pretty easy we could have AO and I different combination, and we, we could take a look at the time series when we compare the latent heat flux uh, with the direct measurement from the model. It's off, and off by a lot, okay? So, we think that's why, you know, latent and sensible heat flux control the evaporation coming out of the lake, and if all the models, it's underestimate those by a lot during the uh, winter season uh, and lake effects snow event. So basically, everything is heavily underestimated. By the way, most of the weather forecast model give you too much warm bias on the total heat flux. So never get the air temperature right, never get the water surface correct, and then all the latent and sensible heat flux is off. So we are trying to fix all this and to provide the possibility and potential for a really good late effect snow weather forecast model in the next few years, hopefully. Same thing, you know, it, it's off, the black line is observation, if you take a look. And then all the model output, 10 watts per meter heat flux will screw up your ice model for the whole season. <coughs> and then think about the 300 or 250 watts difference or underestimation on that. Basically, you don't have the correct ice structure, you don't have the correct lake surface temperature, you don't have the correct air temperature, and you don't have the correct heat flux. Everything is off. The best we could hope is everything canceled together, so the forecast wasn't that bad. But you know, you got to be lucky on that. <laughs> All right, same thing. It's just bad, and we try to fix that. Uh, and this one, the, the, the one on the left <coughs> upper corner, those are the weather forecast model, both the WARF and the HER, the high resolution rapid fresh, using the weather surface people would know, the RTG surface temperature. Uh, resolution wasn't very good, uh, temperature wasn't very good, doesn't have enough spatial temporal resolution, <coughs> wasn't updated frequent enough. What we try to do is using the forecast model from the hydrodynamic model, the Great Lake Operational Forecasting System, update frequently the real three-dimensional uh, model derived surface temperature, then feed into the forecast model to provide, hopefully, provide the better heat flux and all the parameters and variables so we could have a better prediction on the snow, um, wind, and also other variable from the weather forecast model. Those are some of the sample, actually, the forecast. How many of you are actually look at the standard NSEP HER model output on a daily basis? It's actually better. It's getting better right now. And we hopefully we are, you know, one of those are wind field, one of those are reflectance, one of those are snow amount, and the other is SST. So they doing 18 or 24 hours update in every single hour. This is, I think, by far the best available one. Although you know, it's keep upgrading, they are in, in enhancing the physics right now. They are increasing the resolution right now. So the next upgrade will have a better physics and hopefully better forecast of everything. Our preliminary finding. This is a two-year project. So. Right now, we are doing evaluation. So the, the whole, people always ask me, you know, this is great. When can I have this? It will take a while. Uh, how Weather Service and NOAA works is they follow the nice step or nice stage procedure. So university and us, the 
researcher people sort of developing, improving the system. Then in the middle, will take two or three hours to do the serious <coughs> validation, verification, demonstration, test bed, semi-operation. Then after that, you transition to the National Ocean Service or the Weather Service as an operational product. So we are in the middle of implementing the system, and hopefully next upgrade will be much better. Um, in general, this is a year one of our study. What we find is the operational wind model tend to be on the low side, usually about two meters per second too low. And that will also impact your total heat flux prediction as well. Uh, we find there's a warm air temperature bias. All the weather forecast model doesn't matter, and CFS is the worst. Uh, underestimate the latent and sensible heat flux <laughs> during the winter season. Uh, really low bias on the SST used in the current weather forecast model. We require better lake SST to improve temperature, to improve the heat flux, to improve the lake effect snow and the ice prediction. To put together the best individual component doesn't guarantee better forecast or model performance. So what we are saying is we are looking for the best combination, not the best individual component. <coughs> you put best individual component together, usually the result of forecast is suboptimal. So that's why it takes a long time and a lot of trial and error find the best coupling frequency, find the best resolution, find the optimal combination of the heat flux and the parameterization and the SSD. So that's, that's one of the findings, and I figured that out a long time ago. OK, so that's all I want to say about the, uh, the <coughs> effect snow, because it's such a hazardous event, and everybody in the Great Lakes know about that. So I'm going to spend more time talk about media tsunami. I saw people leaving already. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to tell you this. Uh, how many of you, it's the first time you've heard of, about media tsunami? All right. And, uh, okay. and I know some of the people did already. And how many of the people in the audience that knew about media tsunami, it's because of the article in Columbus Dispatch run two weeks ago where a reporter interviewed Dr. Hopgood on this very subject. Anybody see the dispatch two weeks ago? All right, so, okay, let's talk about this. Because, you know, I'm so grateful you are all stick around because uh, this is a really interesting subject and a lot of people actually don't believe that. Uh, I remember our collaborator, you know, in addition to me and Eric Anderson at Plural, uh, the research part was done at Professor Ching Wu <coughs> at University of Wisconsin Madison, and a couple of his graduate students do a lot of research and climatology work on medial tsunami. A great man at the Weather Service Detroit office, and also Michael Engolf at Tsunami Program office. So, what Ching Wu, Professor Ching Wu, told me that when he made a presentation a couple of years ago, probably five or six years ago, on medial tsunami and half of the audience left right away, okay? <laughs> and the other half that did not leave fast enough, they are laughing so hard, and they couldn't stand up and get out of it. So, <laughs> here, you know, just to tell you, I was one of those non-believers six years ago, but please keep an open mind and look into this, and I think you will be, hopefully you will be all convinced by looking at the data and water level gauge, and this is a true phenomenon. Okay, what happened is, the medial tsunami is a tsunami-like wave, but not generated by the earthquake. It's generated by the atmos atmospheric disturbance, something like the, the convective storm, the ratio, or, or some other storm, and that causing the sudden water level change, but it exhibits the clear tsunami signal. Not very high, but it's fast current and it will caught people off guard uh, many times. And usually it's after <coughs> the storm passed because they decoupled with the storm itself. And their characteristics, it's basically propagating from the source, generated by the storm, 
uh, wind turbine. Period less than two minutes to two hours, and they are long wavelengths relative to other wind waves. Often appear as a rapid rising or declining water level, <coughs> and can be single wave or a series of waves. So, you know, when we're talking about tsunami, it's 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 a Japanese and basically means big wave in English. And 80%, 90% of those, it's all earth gener earthquake generated or landslide. But there was a certain percentage, 10, 15%, it's by atmospheric driven event. Okay, why are they dangerous? They, they become decoupled from the source mechanism. And usually, a lot of people think, you know, get swept away, say it's sunny afternoon and, and the wave coming out of nowhere, okay? And in Great Lakes, they reflect wave can appear out of nowhere, and a lot of times just like recurrence, okay? And right now, it's very hard to detect and very hard to forecast, um, can create recurrence and invasion. And you might wondering, you know, if this thing really exists, how come I never heard of that? And the reason for that is because people don't realize that particular wave type is a meteor tsunami signal. So if you look at all the report, all the clips, and either they either say, well, Great Lakes Freak Wave, or they either say recurrence, or they either say uh, super high tidal wave, and anything but meteor tsunami. So a lot of the, the fact is they've been mislabeled by other severe weather event, or SESH, the most common uh, mislabeled is, a, they say, big SESH. But you know, so this is basically the physical mechanism uh, for the meteor tsunami generation. First, you need to have a storm, or convected storm, you know, MCS, uh, derecho, or some other type. Uh, the trick is usually combined with a sudden pressure, air pressure jump, or disturbance. And then the, the whole front or storm moving at a certain wind speed and past the lake. And the lake will create an amplification on the water level causing by the, uh, the, the passing storm. And people always ask, you know, do you need a hurricane force to create this one? And the thing is, a lot of meteor tsunami wasn't generated by a very strong or fast storm at all. And, and not every single storm or duration will cause in or, or create meteor tsunami. That's the tricky part. There's a wild card there that pretty much determine uh, whether the meteor tsunami will occur in Lake Erie or Lake Michigan or not. It's the depth of the lake. Okay? So, the, the speed of the storm need to couple or combine with the good or correct uh, bathymetry or depth of the lake. It will follow the simple shallow wave equation, square root of gravity plus the depth. With that, <coughs> like a Goldilocks combination, you have the pressure jump, you have a system, you have a storm moving at a certain speed that corresponding to a certain depth of the lake. And then when it passes, it will create the meteor tsunami signal, and then it will bounce back and forth in the lake, and then causing recurrence. And that's our newest theory. Theory: a lot of rec recurrence might be the wave-wave interaction that uh, passing back and forth in that first meteor tsunami signal. <coughs> you, you can see that our uh, recreation or reconstruction using the wave model to create uh, the medial tsunami. That's the water level. So if you see the red one, that means high water level. If you see the blue one, that means fast current and the water is away from the shore. All right, and that's one of the famous Chicago event. So the other frequent asked question is, how does medial tsunami wave different than the sash or wind generated wave. So if you look from the frequency and the period, you would know most of the wind generated wave in the Great Lakes, it's very short period, five seconds to 12 seconds, that's about it. And if you think about the sash, uh, in Lake Erie, 14 hours, right? And Michigan, nine hours. So that's 
definitely not in the green driven sash period. So you could see if you do time series analysis, spectral analysis, or EOF, you will see strong signal in that two minutes to two hour uh, period. That's the clearly uh, the medial tsunami signal. And, and anybody want to take a guess how many medial tsunami happen in the Great Lakes every year? Come on. <laughs> what? Four. One five? Yeah. 106. <laughs> so, in general, well, 90% of those are low, under a foot or so. Nobody even notice or care. But once in a while, you will get a big one. Three footer, five footer, ten footer. But if we, well, I didn't. The poor graduate student at the University of Wisconsin, they pull up all the water level gauge, tight gauge record in every single Great Lakes. All right? And in the past 20 years. That's the climatology they come up with. You know, 106 times medial tsunami occurrence in a year on average above half meter, so you know, a foot or so. And the causing damage, and people get drunk. And we could take a look at some of the clips. So another poor graduate student <laughs> looking into all the archives in the newspaper back in the 50s or 20s, okay? Remember, that time they don't have Google search or internet. So those poor graduate students go to the library and, and the archive and find every single event in the Great Lakes region. And look at the title, tidal wave, freak wave, sash, and something nobody knows, but causing property damage and swimmer gets swept away in a sunny day, all right? It does happen. It's not just the Great Lakes. You know, it's a worldwide phenomenon. So all the coastal area, harbor, Mediterranean, Adriatic Sea, it all happened. And they all pretty much have similar statistics. So there's a lot of international experts working on medial tsunami in different countries. And they all understand the physical process pretty well. All right. Some historical events. 1929, Grand Haven. Well, I'm not going to read, but you could see every single case that's already been identified. And usually sunny afternoon, uh, people go to the beach swimming, and you know, wave coming out of nowhere and sweat them away. And 10, 7, 5 deaths every time. All right? 1929. 1938, Michigan. Five deaths. <coughs> 1929, Chicago. Chicago got a pretty big one, several big ones. 29, 54, you know, all casualties. And those two on uh, 29. And this is one of the tricky one or interesting one in 1954, 58. Two events and passing in certain direction at a certain wave speed. And when that speed hit the proper uh, Lake Michigan depth, it will create the ampli amplification and high wave, medial tsunami wave uh, along the shore of Michigan. And then after the storm pass, it will bounce back and forth. A lot of those damage or swimmer gets swept away, it's storm already paid, passed. And it's a secondary or the third wave coming back from the other side or because of the, the shape of the, uh, the southern Lake Michigan causing those. So wind speed, direction, pressure jump, bathymetry, you know, you need an ideal combination for this to happen. Again, okay. red is high water levels, blue is the reflection or, or the rip currents that people retreat or draw away from the shore. And those are the dangerous ones because those current and velocity is fairly high. And a lot of those, you don't need a high water level to uh, causing damage or people get off guard. Uh, a foot to a foot will cause enough damage because they rise so fast. Yeah, that's, this is a really interesting one. And look at the, the retreat or the low in those areas. Those are the reflection from the first medial tsunami wave. 
all right? All the waves bouncing back and forth at different frequency at a different period. And then wave-wave interaction, then plus the new wing, plus the bosimetry, plus the currents. So it's a really messy bathtub. All right, more recent one, 1998, uh, White Lake, Michigan. That's the uh, main one and causing some property damage. That's the July 4th case. It looked like, you know, the holiday, right? The Christmas memorial, the uh, July 4th. Sunny day, long weekend. Everybody goes to the beach, and then wave coming out nowhere. Seven swimmer drowned. And then for Lake Erie, okay? I'm, I'm sure the, uh, the more recent one, um, Fairport and Madison, that Cleveland Weather Office get a couple of reporting and we got a phone call and asked, you know, anything unusual on the lakes and we couldn't find anything. It's a calm day and no wind, no storm, but wave coming from nowhere. All right, so I want to talk about, you know, the progress we made so far on this. It's a university researcher doing the research and we try to uh, work with a weather service office and to do something, you know, either the detection mechanism or have a better model to predict it or um, work with warning or advisory protocol and find a system that could deliver those messages in an appropriate form. So those are the things we are trying to do. So uh, last year, there's a couple of Media tsunami work related shop, workshop and summit, uh, one at the University of Michigan, and then later in the September, there was a weather service host a media tsunami workshop with all the regional uh, weather forecast office, plus the tsunami warning center, plus the storm prediction center. We try to figure out the appropriate uh, message. Uh, and the, the protocol to deliver those hazards. And there'll be uh, next May, first international symposium. We'll get all the international collaborator and scientists together and figure out a better way to do or establish a better reliable forecasting system. So have we seen this before? Yeah, we just saw that. It's the same thing as slate effect snow. So any hazard for reliable forecasting system. You need the same four things, right? <coughs> Data, model, infrastructure, and communication. How do you deliver the message? Especially this one, it's tricky, and it might involve some social scientists and find the best protocol or message for this kind of warning. We don't want to people freak out, because when you're talking about tsunami, they think about 10 or 20 foot wave, like the one happened in Iran, India, or seismic or earthquake generated tsunami. All right, so I just mentioned that, you know, if everything is good, um, resources is not the limit. <laughs> Money is not the limit. And we have the science nailed down. We know what are the correct variables. We reduce the uncertainty. We have a very fast, high resolution model with data simulation technique. But one of the requirements to do all this is we need a very fast, high-performance computing. Very, very, very fast. Why is that? Okay, just give you an example from the scientific point of view. All right, I know this is not going to happen to be an operational uh, setting in the weather service. But for us researchers, we have to assume you, know, you have everything at your hand. Do the best you can. So. Let's say you know, every modeler say, okay, to improve the forecast, weather forecast, we need to double the spatial resolution. Instead of five kilometers, we need a one kilometer grid, or we need a half kilometer or sub kilometer to resolve all the physics, all the cloud physics, all the moisture, everything we need, all right? Remember, every time you double your computer spatial resolution, it requires 10 times more computing resources, okay? And then we need to couple, right? The weather model needs to be coupled with the lake circulation model. Lake circulation model needs to be coupled with wave model and ice model. 
Otherwise, we couldn't figure out the correct evaporation rate and the surface temperature. Every time you do model coupling conservatively, adding another 10 times of the computing resources. All right? And then we have data simulation with all the satellite data, with all the instrumentation data. Real time, we need to ingest into the model to have a better initial condition. And we also ingest the satellite remote sensing data in real time to provide a better short-term forecast. Well, add another 10, 10 times. OK, and then with the medium range and long-term forecast, everything, everybody talking about ensemble forecasting, about probabilistic forecasting, you know, to reduce the uncertainty. All right, let's have a conservative 30-member ensemble. You're adding 30 times more. So whatever you are using right now on a supercomputer, think about that. To do everything you want to do, adding 30,000 times. Not just the computing power, but storage space as well. That's why it's hard. That's why it's challenge. And that's why it's expensive. <coughs> I want to share, finally, I think it's about time. I want to share two quotes with you to end my talk. Number one is, <coughs> If you want to find the secret of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Uh, this is from Nikola Tesla. Not the car, but the inventor. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the inventor that Tesla is named after. All right. And I find the same statement also very true. If you want to find out the secret of medial tsunami, think about in terms of energy, <coughs> frequency, and vibration the energy pass or exchange between the air and the water. The frequency of that water level signal uh, so clear on all the tide gauge and all the... You look, you are sitting in the lake at, at the shore and you just see the water level up and down and you will never figure out whether there's a medial tsunami signal or water level change there because it's hard to see. But it's so clear if you look at the period, look at the frequency from the spectral or EOF analysis, and also vibration. Wave is the vibration of water. All right? So hopefully by now you're convinced you know, it happened. It's just you don't know because it's been mislabeled by other sash or name or freaking wave or tidal waves. <laughs> uh, the next one quote I want to share with you. I didn't say that. It's a professor at Columbia University, William Dunn, say that in a paper. Okay? I'm not going to read it. You can read it by yourself. But look at the highlight, the, the coupled approach, all right? The gravity wave, edge wave, and sash. And all parts of the oil lake and provide a good warning system by moving disturbance in the atmosphere. You know, all make sense, right? Do you find, are you agree with this statement? Okay. It's nothing fancy. What amazed me, and I'm sure amazed all of you, is when was the statement made on the whole thing? It's 1958, 60 years ago, on JGR, after he studied that 1954 Chicago event. And, you know, I'm just fascinated. In 1954, there was no supercomputer. There was only very few tight gauge or water level gauge. There was only very few weather sensor network. But they all got to figure out. They figured out everything in 60 years ago. And I feel we are really fortunate. We have the data. We have the model. We have the infrastructure. I think it's about time to build a reliable forecasting system. And I want to finish my talk here. Uh, I will be glad to answer any other questions. Oh, by the way, two final things I want to share with you. Um, one is, you know, well, just one. For, for the audience, I hope you know, everything you learn right now is keep an open mind. You, didn't, you don't see it doesn't mean it, 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 it doesn't exist. Now for the student and graduate student in this audience, um, I used to, I still supervise several graduate students at different universities. Um, 
a lot of times graduate students come and ask me, you know, Philip, what do you think about this topic? What do you think about this topic? And I always, my standard answer is, your topic, whether it's a thesis or a dissertation, need to pass the lab test. What I mean by the lab test? When you propose the topic or idea, if no one laughed at you, it's not good enough. <laughs> it's not bold enough. You won't make a society impact in the future. If everybody laughed at you, okay, go ahead. That might be an interesting topic, but it will take 10 or 15 years for people to figure out. So I'll, I'll finish that. Thank you. <laughs> poster, okay, available on Media Tsunami for everybody. That's the uh, press conference we did at the Ocean Science Meeting two weeks ago. I'll be glad to share with you. Thank you.